The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So, very nice to see people here today. Good. <laughs> and uh, last week I wasn't here, Venal Mudito was giving a talk. It was quite interesting because I gave a talk somewhere else and it was the same subject. <laughs> we, we hadn't talked about it, which was about uh, the spiritual friend, the Kalyana Mitta. So I can't talk about that today. <laughs> so today I'd like to talk about another subject, uh, which is very important to us. And I'll just introduce it with, so it doesn't give, give it away straight away, <laughs> and introduce it with a uh, verse from the Buddha. Unfortunately, I haven't got it in Pali, but I've got it in English. And it's a very strong verse, so you'll get the, the idea of the subject of the talk this morning very quickly. Every person who is born is born with an axe in their mouth. A fool who uses abusive or harsh, speech, harsh language cuts themselves and others with that axe. So that's... Pretty strong, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty strong. Every person who is born is born with an axe in their mouth. A fool who uses abusive or harsh language cuts themselves and others with that axe. But I always add, but we don't need to use the axe. And that's what this talk is about. <laughs> Not using the axe. And I know Ajahn Brahm, he'd probably update this from axe to the chainsaw. <laughs> Every person is born with a chainsaw in their mouth. And it's true that we can, with our speech, we can really cause a lot of harm and hurt and damage to other people. And uh, especially with children, this can be the case too, you know, from, uh, from teachers, from parents, um, for, from other children too at school. I well remember school. School children can be pretty tough. <laughs> So what we say is very important and how we say it is very important. So they both go together actually, it's not just what we say. Because sometimes people say things which are not terribly offensive in themselves, in itself, but the way they say it, wow, it really you know, come, hits home. So this is of course, I think, what, what was the subject area do you think this is? I think right speech, yeah, so it's very important aspect of the path. The Buddha devotes a whole factor of the Noble Eightfold Path to right speech, and as you, uh, which means it's something very important uh, for our practice. And of course everybody knows speech <laughs> is where it all starts from, where the defilements actually often become uh, very evident. And it's speech is what leads often to violence and, and difficulties between people. So right speech, of course, is the third aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it's good to remember that we need the whole of the Eightfold Path. They all work together in a way. They all work together and they build on each other. But really for right speech, there are four factors of the Noble Eightfold Path that are absolutely essential for us to develop right speech. They support right speech. And so and I've spoken about the first two, you may not, may not remember, right view. I don't know what I called it, uh, this, the talk, probably uh, reality check is what I usually think of when I talk about right view. And the second factor, right intention, which I think I was talking about it as emotional intelligence. But right view is the, uh, is the view, the uh, view of reality that an enlightened being has. And one of those aspects, uh, and it covers, of course, you know, the fact that giving is important and has um, a great uh, effect. Not only giving, but there's karma, rebirth, there are other, um, other worlds, other lives, and that there are enlightened beings, beings that have experienced reality directly and can, can tell others about it. But the aspect that affects us here, of course, you know, with speech, is the fact that there's karma. We make karma by what we say. We make karma by what we do, and we make karma by what we think. But speech is one of the biggies. <laughs> it really is a big one, where we're making a lot of karma. And this, not, this is not only, of course, just by speaking. 
it's these days, it's all the written, uh, the written aspects of it too, you know, and uh, maybe even videos, that sort of thing. So the internet has really enhanced the potential for wrong speech and right speech too. So that's very good. So hopefully today, <laughs> on the internet, <laughs> live streaming something from right speech, so that's good. And the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path that supports right speech is right intention. Because right intention is where we're coming from, as I called it, the emotional intelligence. So if you're coming from, uh, from letting go, not trying to get, giving, this is nekama. And if, we're, if coming from loving kindness, and from, which is non, uh, uh, non-ill will, sometimes they call it avirpada. If we're coming from non-harming or hurting, this is compassion, then our speech, if we've got these three qualities in our mind, our speech will, won't be something that hurts others. It won't be hurting us as well. And that's the important thing to remember too when the Buddha mentions the axe cuts themselves and others. So what is he meaning by that? They're making karma that will come back to that person later, maybe this life or in future lives. So this, this factor is very important for the whole Noble Eightfold Path, how we're practicing it, where we're coming from. So, and of course, a crucial factor for, uh, for um, speech, our speech, is right effort. This is samavayama. So we have to know if something is negative, unwholesome, uh, and we have to know what is positive, what is wholesome. So if we're speaking and we can, we're aware, ah, this is, this is something unwholesome, this is something negative, then we can do something about it. Then we can develop, uh, can let go of that and develop positive or wholesome speech. So this is very, very important because if we're not aware of where we're coming from, whether it's negative or positive, it can, you know, we can say all sorts of things and then later think, oh, oh that wasn't good, <laughs> that wasn't good. And as I often emphasize with right effort, if we actually develop the habit to speak, you know, from, in a positive way, in a wholesome way, it actually creates that habit that helps us let go of the negative tendencies uh, in our speech. Because this is basically it. We're very, we're creatures of habit. Of course, mindfulness is what is getting us off, that, getting us out of those habits. But if we have habits, it's better to have good habits. And so if we can create, you know, by right effort, positive and wholesome ways of speaking, not only to others. Who do you think is very important? We speak to quite often? Ourselves. Sometimes the things we say to ourselves, we would dare, we'd never dare say to anybody else. And that's not, that's not very kind, because that's not sama sankapa, that's not right intention. Because we need to be kind and understanding, particularly with ourselves, and forgiving too. So this is essential, this aspect of, you know, knowing whether something is wholesome or uh, wholesome, positive, or negative, unwholesome. And it's the essence of the teachings that... Uh, our practice is, is something for us on an individual basis. So this is a very, very important aspect of the teaching. If we cannot recognize something as positive or negative, it's really difficult to do anything about it. We won't do anything about it. And the other factor that I'd like to mention, of course, and I just mentioned it, is right mindfulness. If we are not present, if we're just coming from automatic, we can say anything, <laughs> and we won't be we won't be very aware of it. Maybe later the mindfulness will kick in. We we'll say, "Oh my God, what did I say?" <laughs> you know, I didn't really mean that. And the interesting thing with speech is you can't rewind it. You can't take it back once it's made the impression. That's that's in there actually. So with mindfulness, we know what we're saying. We know what we're doing, and hopefully, we know what we're thinking. You know. And so we can come off this autopilot, automatic, and then have choice about what we say, choose uh, to say positive things, or we can, can choose to say negative things. It is up to us. So those four factors we really need all the time when we speak. We really need all the time 
when we do any, any, any action, actually. We need to have a view, uh, come from right view. We need to come from a good place. This is right intention, emotional intelligence. And we need to be able to uh, distinguish the negative from the uh, positive, the unwholesome from the wholesome. This is right effort. And we also need just to be aware of what we're doing, you know, because if we're not, we haven't got much choice. We haven't got much potential for developing right speech and letting go of wrong speech. So now I'll talk a little bit about the types of wrong speech. I don't think we really need it. <laughs> Most people know all the, the types of wrong speech, but I think, you know, when, when I look at the way the Buddha presents, you know, speech, I think it's pretty comprehensive. It'd be interesting if anybody else comes up with other types of wrong speech, actually. But he comes, the way the Buddha divides speech, wrong speech, is uh, lying as wrong speech. We, we had the uh, precept, we, we took the precept, Musawada, where Amani Sikapadang Samadhi And of course, divisive speech, this is dividing others from uh, uh, other people. So we're deliberately doing that, trying to divide a person from another person. Um, and this, uh, this can, I think the most common manifestation of this is talking behind their backs, talking behind a person's back, you know, and then giving the other person a bad impression. But it's usually with this deliberate intention to divide them, you know, maybe to get the person who you're dividing uh, from the other person, get them on board with yourself, you know, so that they're your friend. So that's the second type of wrong speech. And harsh speech is the third. This is harsh or abusive speech when people insult others. And I go into it in a little bit more detail, but I think everybody knows this one. And um, uh, it's quite interesting because on, on the plane when I went to, I went to Townsville recently and the other day, and when we were landing, I was sitting next to two men, and every second word was a swear word, but they weren't aware of it. <laughs> it's sort of like, and it was also a sort of way of bonding, strangely enough, that's what I thought, you know, sort of to say, we're on the same page, and I thought, wow. This is and I, if you said to them, oh, you know, this is, this is harsh, harsh speech, you know, or a rough speech, I don't think they would understand at all, because they're not mindful of it at all. It's become, you know, sort of a, a way of relating, telling other people, yeah, we're well, on the same page. <laughs> so very interesting, actually. Um, and uh, the fourth type uh, of wrong speech is gossip, uh, sometimes called idle chatter, but I prefer gossip because it gives much more of the sense of the danger in it, because gossip is something that can be very, very destructive. And of course, you know, in terms of practicing right speech, the first aspect is to refrain from wrong speech, not do that. And that is really good karma, the Buddha said, to intentionally not say the things that one would like to say out of anger, irritation, or whatever it is. Intentionally not to lie, uh, not to use divisive speech, not to try and divide people. Intentionally not to use harsh speech, and intentionally not to gossip. But the other aspect of speech, right speech, of course, is um, developing the positive side of, of those different types of speech. So, you know, lies, the opposite of lies? Truth, truth yeah, telling the truth. And the opposite of divisive speech? Inclusive or harmonious speech, unifying speech, that's good. And the opposite of a harsh or abusive speech? Kind. kind, yes, gentle, kind, pleasant. And the opposite of gossip? <laughs> so I, I like that, that's good. <laughs> Usually we say meaningful speech, you know, something that's related, it's got a bit of substance. And also, Often, often gossips about other people, isn't it, really? So about ourselves, you know, actually something meaningful that connects with other people from our own experience. So now it's time, after a lot of talking, to tell a Nazarudin story, <laughs> which is about speech. Nazarudin was a uh, um, Sufi, holy person, uh, and um, a very interesting teacher, perhaps, who was, was a real person, I think, in Turkey in the 1200s or something like that. 
And one day Nasruddin had made an appointment with a philosopher and I presume they were going to have an interesting discussion or debate, the philosopher and Nasruddin. I don't know, I think the, the philosopher would have lost, <laughs> lost the debate actually. And he came, he knocked on Nasruddin's door. Nasruddin didn't answer because he'd forgotten the appointment. And the philosopher was outraged, how dare he? Probably he was a well-known philosopher too. So he wrote on the door, stupid oaf, stupid oaf. And then um, Nasruddin came home, the philosopher went away, and he came home and there he saw, stupid oaf written on the, oh, ah, the philosopher, the philosopher's been, oh, I forgot the appointment. So he rushed to his house and, and he said, Ah, he said, oh, I saw you'd come. You'd left your name on the door. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know that the philosopher would have been any... <laughs> he probably wasn't feeling better disposed <laughs> to Nazarudin after that. You wrote your name on the door. <laughs> so you left my name. Yes, good. It's very often, because, uh, often too, when we say something negative, people will come back with a negative too. So I call this instant karma. I don't know what the philosopher said. <laughs> Probably hit him, I think. So, yes. And we know that, uh, you know, lying, um, all these th sorts of wrong speech, they cause enormous harm. But good, right speech can cause a lot of benefit. And it's the same with the written presentations that appear in videos, images, and uh, also on the internet, which really speeds everything up, doesn't it? It really makes a gossip go around the world in no time flat. So we know, you know, in great detail what's going on with Harry and Meghan, <laughs> Prince Harry. It just seems to be, you know, so much. I don't know how many people are that interested, but still, seems to be. So, and there's of course uh, very negative aspects of the internet, hate mail. I think uh, I've heard, I remember once giving a presentation at a, a school, a Christian school, and it was a Buddhist, uh, a, a Muslim woman, and a Christian woman. And the Muslim woman was telling me how she, she got hate mail, actually, I remember that. You know, she get hate mail quite regularly. I thought, gee, that's sad. And also, you know, we have the, that sort of hate mail on the um, social uh, media too, you know, Facebook and so on, where kids get bullied on the internet. And uh, it's interesting that this actually, according to what I've seen, you know, on YouTube, of course, <laughs> that it leads to, uh, it's a, a cause, a prominent cause for suicide among young people, this sort of bullying on the internet. So... Refraining from false speech, that's the one level, developing the truth. But it's always interesting to, to look into lying because uh, there's many, value, many things that uh, I can see and these are just interesting questions for us to ask ourselves. Uh, and the response will, be, will inform our practice. Does lying cause harm? Does it cause problems? Or... Is it only when we get caught? Because <laughs> many, many people think that, don't they? It's only when we get caught that it's a problem. But of course it already has created the karma, hasn't it? You know, that negative karma. Because we have deliberately, intentionally trying to deceive somebody. Whether they deceive, we don't know. They may think, oh, come on. <laughs> they may not say anything. But it's that deliberate um, intention. And other aspects of lying of course and we can it's an interesting phenomena too it includes lying about how we feel when people say how are you and you say, oh I'm, I'm fine <laughs> you know sometimes the way people say oh I'm fine it looks pretty obvious that they're not you know they're feeling they're having a bad day or whatever so this may be you know this keeping up appearances may also be an aspect of lying I think that it's so common we, we forget about it and uh, that reminds me of the I think I think it was uh, one of the members' children here, actually, I think it was. The, the, their mother or their father had said, if anybody calls, tell them I'm, I'm not at home. Of course, that was a lie. <laughs> they were, so what does the child do when somebody rings? He says, oh, is mommy at home? No, they're not at home. They told me that they're not at home. <laughs> 
So children are great, you know. So very early on we're conditioning, you know, children to, to lie. We get used to it, a, a level of lying that uh, is interesting. And of course, the other aspect of it is we can lie to ourselves, you know, because we don't like certain aspects of ourselves. So we don't, uh, we, we sort of lie to ourselves where we're actually coming from. We, we're not being honest with ourselves. That's actually the worst in a way, because in terms of spiritual development, we need that honesty, that truthfulness in order to grow. Because the whole path is a path of truth. So if, we, if we're lying to ourselves about ourselves or any other type of lying, you know, this is undermining that commitment to truth, to discovering the truth. And of course there is white lies, you know, that we, we tell when it's difficult, I, I am, sometimes it's difficult for me too actually, sometimes when people ask you things and you know if you tell them exactly the truth, it will hurt their feelings. But this is what the Buddha did uh, about dealing with not hurting people's feelings. This is his advice. Of course, we've got to remember it's coming from a Buddha, <laughs> so it's a pretty high standard. <laughs> We may not measure up to this, but it's, it's, it's very good because it informs us, you know, about, gives us some standards, you know, for, for uh, when we speak to people and we don't want to hurt their feelings. So the Buddha, he, he, would, he said that if something were untrue, incorrect, and not beneficial, he would not say it. So it wasn't beneficial to the other person. So something that's untrue, incorrect, and not beneficial, he wouldn't say it. If it were true, correct, but still not beneficial, he wouldn't say it. But, and the third option, of course, if something were true, correct, and beneficial, he would say it at the right time. Whether the per person liked what he said, or whether they didn't like what he said, said. Because he knew that even sometimes when we have we hear things pointed out, you know, our, our faults, our um, imperfections, there are <laughs> some imperfections, then we can learn and we can grow. And of course, if a Buddha points it out, you know, someone like that, usually the person that he would say that to would be somebody that had respect, that would listen to his words and look into them. Because the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, a very interesting verse, it's great, he says, if a wise person points out our faults, we should think of it as like someone pointing out a treasure, Nidana. Wow. <laughs> but it's very, it's very good to keep in mind that he says, wise person. Many other people that are not wise will point out our faults. So we shouldn't pay too much attention to them. But if somebody is wise, if there's somebody that we do respect, then we should look into it. So this is something, that, this is how the Buddha practiced. And I'll later I'll mention the, um, some, of the, uh, some of the guidelines he gave for uh, uh, right speech. And of course the second type, the divisive or divisive speech, coming, from, or sometimes they call it uh, malicious speech, Pisunavacha in Pali. And this is a very common one that uh, in politics it's very common. <laughs> it's part of the game rules, I think. <laughs> and their aim is to divide people from other people. And the interesting thing the Buddha points out is it's, if it's true that still we have the intention to divide people, it is still creating this uh, bad karma, negative karma of wrong speech. Uh, more so, even more so, if it's untrue, you know, if it's a complete lie, then you've got two, haven't you? have got lying and also you've got this divisive speech, so it, it's, it's double bad um, karma. And the, the Buddha uses a nice uh, 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 phrase for this sort of speech, it's like verbal daggers, verbal daggers. Isn't that good? You've got the axe in the mouth, verbal daggers. <laughs> it's sort of giving you an idea, isn't it? <laughs> it sort of sounds very... Because if you keep these images, it's very interesting. The Buddha uses very extreme images that are hard to forget. That's the reason I think he uses them. Because you think, if you think of an axe in the mouth, it stays with you. If you think of a dagger in the mouth, you think, wow, yes. And then, if we have that in mind, 
we, we think, oh, well, I'll be careful about using this axe. I'll be careful about using this a dagger, this knife. So um, another teaching the Buddha gave on um, how you know, we can relate to other people or how different types of people relate to other people is he, he gave a teaching about the speech of a sage and a fool. This is a sapurisa and the fool. And it's very informative because when I read this list, I think, yes, sometimes I'm the sage, sometimes I'm the fool. <laughs> and just see what you think of this list. So this is about divisive speech, how we speak about others. And also in this context too, he, in, in this teaching, he mentions oneself to how one speaks to one, about oneself to others. So he says that a fool talks about himself um, unasked, he'll talk about himself and his good qualities or her good qualities at length, in great detail, um, taking probably a long time. But if they're asked about their negative qualities, well, very brief, and there'll be quite a bit of rationalising, well, you know, I had to do it, and, um, you know, uh, they don't talk about the ba bad qualities. But when it comes to other people, the Buddha said, asked about the good qualities of other people, they speak well, briefly, you know, they won't dwell on it and get it over very quickly. But unasked they went about the bad qualities of another person or persons, they'll speak for a long time and in great, great detail. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the uh, speech of a fool, you know, it's coming from it's talking about themselves, uh, their positive and negative qualities, and talking about the uh, positive and negative qualities of others. But a sage, now this is very interesting, when asked about their, about, uh, their good qualities, will speak briefly, just, you know, just give a, a little you know, um, uh, idea of their good qualities. This is called humility, isn't it, really? <laughs> You're not bragging or anything. But unasked about their bad qualities, they will speak at length and in detail. I don't know if that's entirely good, actually, <laughs> because uh, yeah, so they w they will not hide their uh, shortcomings. They will not hide their shortcomings, which reminds us, doesn't it, of the the stream entra, their inability to hide their breaking of the five precepts. You know, they won't they won't try and cover it up. So this is how a sage talks about themselves. But when it comes to talking about others. Unasked, they'll speak about the good qualities of other people at great length and in detail, and maybe a few sadhus as well, <laughs> I don't know. And then when they're asked about the bad qualities of other people, they just they only talk about it very briefly, don't go into detail, and presumably only speak from their own experience. So that's the, that's the difference between a sage and a fool. And as I say, we're probably all a bit of a mix you know, <laughs> we're not always sages and we're not always fools, fortunately. But of course this sort of uh, um, a malicious speech can also be uh, sort of disguised or we can be unaware of it. And so it's very good to ask where we're coming from, you know, what, ho what we hope to gain from something, from telling this person about the other person. Are we really, you know, uh, is it really coming from this motivation of wanting to divide them? Maybe want to make this person our friend and alienate them, separate them from the other person. And also, maybe these backhanded compliments too, <laughs> too can be a form of this uh, divisive or malicious speech. So, now the, la the no, not last one. Just a quick one about uh, harsh and abusive speech. I mentioned that I had a very good example on the plane. <laughs> but for them it wasn't uh, probably harsh speech. They didn't recognise it as harsh speech. Quite interesting. And the opposite, developing kind, uh, as a kind and gentle speech. This is the opposite. But uh, this um, um, harsh speech includes swearing, sarcasm, hypocrisy, uh, being overly blunt, that's, that can be uh, very uh, hurtful, cutting, um, belittling criticism, bullying, blackmail, all those things. And of course it comes from a very negative uh, uh, state of mind, from anger, irritation, annoyance. And we always have to remember, you know, I like to promote the idea of karma, especially in Australia, as being like a boomerang. It will come back. 
Yeah. If it's a good, boom, yeah, good, good karma, then that's okay. If it's a bad karma, it will probably hit us by surprise as it comes back. And uh, this is important to, uh, to remember, you know, this sort of harsh speech, this abusive speech, um, you know, when, especially for children. And I know a friend of mine, he said one of his parents, you know, used sh very, very, very uh, uh, harsh speech or abusive speech, really, emotionally abusive. And he said he would have rather they had actually hit him <laughs> than actually spoke like this. So it's good to keep that in mind because our children, you know, they hear that speech over and over again, then they take it on board. So it's very good to uh, uh, remember that. And I like to tell a story, because we need a story now, uh, that's it's a lovely story actually, of a Greek philosopher who had a student, and he told this student that he had to pay money to anyone who insulted him. Had to pay money to anyone who insulted him. I thought it must have really created a real, you know, uh, people probably thought, oh, he pays for insults, and then they'd insult him more and more. And uh, after three years, the, the, uh, his, the philosopher, his teacher, said to him, that's enough. Now you're ready to uh, go to Athens, this is in Greece actually, and learn wisdom. So for three years he was being insulted and paying for it. Really interesting, <laughs> really interesting. And then he goes to Athens and as he's entering Athens, they say, the story says, there was a certain wise person, wise man, who was sitting at the gate insulting everybody who entered the gate. I don't know if that's wise. <laughs> It seems to be a good way to uh, occasion, you know, somebody lashing out and hitting him or, or even killing him, maybe. But he insulted this disciple and the disciple immediately burst into laughter and he said, and the, uh, the wise person, so-called wise person said, why are you laughing when I insult you? And he said, ah, oh, he said, because for three years I had to pay for this. <laughs> now I'm getting it free. <laughs> So one of the, one of the, this is a great story because the underlying thing in a lot of uh, uh, wrong speech, isn't it, apart from anger, is also coming from the sense of I, me, you know, myself. And so when somebody insults us, wow, that's, it comes up big time. And so he, for three years he had been, you know, sort of deluged with this. And so he'd really come to terms with, with speech and, and this sense of the ego, you know, being affected by what others say. So he'd, he'd learnt a big, big lesson, I think, there. But I don't think we need to pay for it. <laughs> but I think if we can see it, especially when we react and the sense of self comes up, ah, this is interesting, you know, as it does. Because the Buddha talks about praise, uh, praise and blame. And both of them actually see the ego, the sense of I, me, come up in a big way. So it's a good teaching. On uh, to look into this uh, sense of self. And the last one, I've got to finish soon, so I've got to, I haven't got to the two major areas actually. Refraining from gossip, and that's uh, developing meaningful speech. And uh, so this is, this is, as I said, you know, it's very, we all know what the gossip is, repeating often what other people say. And it can be, uh, yeah, it's usually repeating something that we have heard. And so this is, it can be very damaging and we can see on the internet how it uh, can affect people in a very negative way. How their careers can be destroyed, how their lives, and some people can commit suicide because of it. And all, always the, we should keep in mind what the Buddha, um, uh, well, I'll mention it in a minute actually, so I'll, I'll leave it for there. The, some of the standards of the Buddha, you know, but the main one here is of course with gossip is this useful? Is it beneficial to, to myself or to the other person to know this? Most gossip, it isn't. And the main reason for the gossip is just to, to uh, be with another person, you know, and you just, you know, it's sort of friendship often and so on. So these, this sort of speech, you know, we can just ask ourselves, is this useful? You know, is it, uh, is it something factual even? You know, because a lot of gossip isn't, you know, it's not in our area of experience, we're just repeating what we've heard. And uh, one of the things that uh, the Buddha had high standards, and he said, is it connected with Dhamma and, and the discipline, the Dhamma and the rules of uh, 
uh, of behaviour, especially for monks and nuns. And this is even better. Is it accompanied by reason? Gossip? Well, <laughs> and is it moderate and full of sense? Now that's the, the, speak, the words of a Buddha, of course. But if we think of those criteria, then gossip it puts gossip in. Uh, we probably think there's no, no area for gossip, and that'd be good. Of course, if there was no gossip, I think many of the newspapers would close down. <laughs> close down, and the internet would be uh, um, much, uh, there'd be much less on the internet. So the principles for developing right speech this is what I call the tests for skillful speech or right speech. And these, this, this is really important from the Buddha. It's actually the basis for ethical behaviour, how we speak, how we act, and also how we think. And the Buddha said, asked, so he was giving this advice to his son, Rahula, Prince Rahula, or Venerable Rahula, sorry. And he was only seven years old at this, this stage, but it's a fantastic teaching which is the basis of all ethics, actually. It's a, and it's a, so very, very useful for me, and I'm sure for most people. Uh, first thing to consider when we're speaking, acting, or even thinking, does it harm me, or does it harm others? Or does it benefit me, does it benefit others, or both? So we're looking at harm and benefit. Is my speech what I'm going to say of harm? Will it harm somebody else, harm me? Is it of benefit to somebody else, benefit it to me? And then to look at the motivation, where we're coming from. Is this a, a positive thing, positive speech or negative speech? Um, where we're coming from is very important. And then the Buddha, being so complete, actually, says, what are the consequences after we've said what we've said? said, are the results pleasant or painful? And uh, the interesting thing with this criteria, whether something's harmful or beneficial, where we're coming from, uh, is it a, a good place or not, and the consequences, whether they, the results are pleasant or painful. The Buddha says we should, before we do something, say something, I don't know about think something, we should use this criteria, these three things, when we're doing it and afterwards. That's quite, a, that's quite a lot, especially when you think his son was seven years old <laughs> when he was telling him this. This is a fantastic teaching, but you wonder how much a seven-year-old would take it in. So, and the other things that the Buddha mentions, this is actually more uh, particularly in terms of when one is, uh, you know, we say in English, telling someone off, and they call it ovada, you're giving, you know, giving some... Uh, guidance to somebody or you're pointing out something that's a better way isn't it pointing out something to somebody and he says right speech on this occasion and these this is a very good criteria actually i mentioned them again at the end in a different form it's got to be the right time you know not while somebody's in with other people they really really get upset if you do if you tell them off if you point something out um, in a public situation and it's a very, it can have a, cause a lot of hurt for the other person. And they can get angry and very upset. And they, they won't hear what you're saying to them, which may be very useful for them. And the Buddha says we should talk about facts, what's true, what's actually, uh, what we actually know to be the case. And we should consider, is this beneficial for the other person to hear? Like we mentioned before, the speech of a Buddha, he always reflected if it's something that was beneficial for the other person. And he said, the next thing is to speak gently and softly, so not, <laughs> not to shout at them <laughs> or um, you know, speak in an irritated tone. And the last one, speaking from loving kindness. This is when we're pointing out some, something to somebody. As you know, it's a very difficult thing to do uh, you know, because people get very sensitive and they can take it the wrong way. But if we have all these criteria, speaking at the right time, speaking what's factual, thinking of the benefit of the other person, and speaking in a soft, gentle way, and also from loving kindness, there's usually that's got a much better chance of succeeding if we're pointing out something we need to point out. One of the other criteria the Buddha mentions in another list of five, actually, for a person who is about to point out something, do we do the same thing? 
<laughs> if we're doing the same thing that we're pointing out for another person, that is hypocrisy. <laughs> so it's very good to reflect, actually, where and especially where we're coming from. But one of the things I was just going to mention to finish off, and it's, it's a very important area I mentioned, there were four things, four factors in the Noble Eightfold Path that support right speech, and that is, of course, right view, as I mentioned, right intention where we're coming from, and also uh, right effort, knowing the difference between the positive and the negative, the wholesome and the unwholesome, and also mindfulness. So I'd like to mention mindfulness a bit more because it's a very important aspect that allows us to be aware of our speech. And I, um, I spent uh, three months quite a few while ago at uh, uh, Sayadu Utejaniya's monastery, and it's called Shweyu Min Center in Myanmar. And he emphasizes Chitanupasana, watching the mind, but particularly watching the reactions of the mind to whatever we experience. And one of the interesting, and particularly the defilements, watching the defilements that come up, uh, recognizing them. He has a lovely book called Don't Look Down on the Defilements. They will laugh at you. They are. <laughs> They're always laughing at us. <laughs> and they often get a good ha upper hand. One of the things that they emphasized there, in most, most the meditation centers, it was a meditation center, they said, noble silence, noble silence. No, no, you must speak to other people. I want you to be mindful as you speak. And that is something quite interesting because you don't hear that very much at a meditation centre. But because it's such an important area, it's very useful to develop an awareness of how we're speaking, what we're saying, where we're coming from. Because, of course, it's Chitanapasana. This is the uh, what part of the uh, Satipatthana, the foundations of mindfulness. Uh, focuses of mindfulness, so that's what Anjan Brahm uses. And it's the, the area of being aware of the state of the mind, what state the mind in, is in, whether there are positive qualities, negative qualities in the mind. So it's very useful, you learn a lot. So they encourage the meditators to speak to each other, but to bring this mindfulness to it. And so then they can learn, we can learn a lot about our speech, we can learn a lot about where we're coming from. And it gives us, when we're aware of what we're doing, gives us the choice not to say things, not to you know, tell a lie or an exaggerate. Where's, what's the, what's the, the, uh, the difference sometimes between exaggeration? What's the line, I think that's the word? The line between lying and exaggeration, you know, that, that's an interesting one. Or not to say something negative, divisive, not to say something harsh not to say something that's gossip. That's probably the hardest one because <laughs> it seems fairly innocent, actually. So when we, when we actually are aware of our speech, it actually addresses a lot of the uh, defilements of greed, hatred and delusion that are there, that come up you know, in our speech, in our conversations with other people. Often wrong speech or, uh, is coming from this, uh, particularly from from uh, negativity, ill will, irritation, annoyance, all those sorts of things. But often it's coming from delusion too, from the sense of me, I, you know, and all this. And uh, so this is actually one of the driving forces for uh, wrong speech, as is, you know, delusion in the sense of misunderstanding what another person says. You know, it's incredible. I think nine-tenths of arguments probably are about misunderstandings, you know. We're just different, we're using different words and we've misunderstood each other. So it's a very important aspect of it. And this training to see the defilements and then to say no to them is actually v central to the Buddha's teaching and to develop happiness from that, to be happy that we're able to say no to greed. I mentioned Chadston, the Chadston test. When you <laughs> Can you walk from one side of the Chadston shopping centre, big shopping centre near here, to the other side without buying anything? And you still have your money and your credit card with you. <laughs> if you. If you pass that test, that's pretty amazing. Chadston will be very disappointed. <laughs> very disappointed. They'll send someone here. <laughs> He's bad for business. <laughs> but 
And like, uh, so this ability to say no is actually something that leads to our happiness and to strength of mind. Sometimes people feel like, because in farmers they tell you, oh, you've got, you've got to get this. If you don't get this, you know, oh, it's just the right colour, it's the right size, oh, I should get it now. The defilements will always tell us to go for it, whether it be greed, whether it be hatred. They deserve it. They deserve it. I'm right. They're wrong. Or, or you know, these, all these sorts of things. So the defilements will always encourage us, but our ability to say no to them is a great strength, and it's the essence of ethics, actually. But to actually get happiness from it, fantastic. I said no to it. <laughs> and this is quite a strong thing that I would usually say yes to. So... And one of my favourite sayings in this line is from Bhante Ji, and he's talking... Do you know who Bhante Ji is? Bhante Gunaratana, the famous monk, Sri Lankan monk who lives in America, who wrote the famous book, Mindfulness in Plain English. And he's done a, a number of other books, actually, that are, are wonderful, that are very good. And he's a, a lovely monk. He used to travel quite a lot here and came to the BSV... Oh, I think he was here... T- 2014 or something the last time. I remember I was here when he was here. And he says, and this is true of all the defilements, but he's talking about anger. He says, simply refuse to let your anger tell you what to say. Because that's what it's doing, isn't it? It's telling us what to say. It's greed. It's telling us what to do. Get it. <laughs> you know. And this ability to say, no, no, I won't do it, is very good because it's really liberating because this is part of our a very strong uh, habit pattern, very strong conditioning of these defilements. And our ability to say no is really can... If we do it in the right way, it will give rise to happiness and a feeling like, wow, I'm getting some freedom. (laughs) I'm getting some space in my life. And Bhante Ji, he recommends for people before they respond with anger is to take some deep breaths. And he says, two minutes, I think that's a long time. That's some anger, actually. It must be big anger. He says 30 in-breaths and out-breaths. I also, you know, I use myself and I mention to others the 478 breath that Dr. Andrew Vile teaches on the YouTube. That is very good too for any of these states, whether it be anger, anxiety, um, all those, all, all these states. It's very useful for, because it gives a bit of a space. It calms the mind down. It breaks the thinking uh, that's feeding the anger. Um, uh, and uh, therefore, it can bring some peace to the mind for a very short for a short time. And you notice when you're meditating, this is one of Ajahn Chah's suggestions too, that if there's a lot of thinking, take a few deep breaths, two or three deep breaths, and you notice the thinking really does subside very very quickly. You know, and it can come back, but this was you know it's very obvious actually and when the thinking is reduced then all that reacting all the uh, anger or whatever emotion is being fed by that thinking whether it be depression anxiety uh, whether it be anger subsides so very useful so these uh, and as I say you know this speech is a place we will see the defilements come up in a big big way and when we're working with them, this is a very important part of the path. And as I say, to get, to get some choice, to get some freedom from the defilements. And we can, of course, we can make what helps actually with uh, speech, particularly if we've got strong habits, negative habits, is to make a resolution or a determination. We won't say that or say it in that way. And maybe we can even... Uh, do some more reprogramming and say, we'll, we'll talk in a soft way, and we'll choose our words well, and we'll bring harmony to the situation. Something like that. So this is called like a resolution or a determination. Program, programming the mind against the negative speech, but also programming it to bring up positive speech as well. And yes, so I think... I'll just end there because I'm over time. We started a little late. Just to remind you of that test, this is a, I think Bhante G had this one actually, but it's a combination of some of the, the main points that the Buddha mentions. It's a test of skillful speech, he says. Is it true? That's, that's important. Is it kind? Is it beneficial? Or does it harm myself or others? Is this the right time to say it? 
So those things are a very good test. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it beneficial or harmful? And is it the right time? If we can remember those, then our speech will be good speech, right speech. It will be speech that promotes harmony and connection with people. It will be speech that will develop meaning and purpose in our life. It will be speech that lets go of negative states of mind and, and will help us on the path. So that our speech becomes, as the Buddha said, you know, full of uh, reason and uh, sense. And he often mentions this sort of speech, very good speech, right speech, is something people like to record, remember. <laughs> so I'd like to encourage yourself, all, all of you and myself actually, to develop uh, right speech, good speech, to not use the axe in the mouth, not use the, d the dagger we have in our mouths, and, and instead to develop right speech, good speech, speech that actually benefits us and so that we can grow on the path, the Noble Eightfold Path. So thank you very much. So are there any questions? We have a few minutes, but I've gone over time. Yes, Dr. Jaya. Yes. First of all, uh, to continue this uh, right speech, at 12 o'clock we have a Dhamma discussion. Late oh, Dhamma discussion. very good. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, that's good. Dhamma discussion at 12.30? Yes, yes. Yes, for the for the lay people. Yes, this is going to yeah. be uh, it's good. The, the question, uh, the Mante, I mean, Buddha's time, the communication by oral tradition, mm -hmm. there was nothing written. So um, when you say right speech today, it really right communication or, it, or interact with each other. So which includes, uh, as you said, social media, what's yeah. written on papers, all these things come under mm -hmm. that category, because you can do a lot of harm by. Fake news, yes, fake news, character assassinations, fake. slandering, mm. articles. Mm. So that's all come under this particular yes. global uh, yeah. uh, thing. Okay, no, that's very good. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. Yes, I think that's good to keep in mind because they have a big impact these days. Yeah. You know, very big. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, the uh, um, when I was doing the teens group, I think last year. And uh, one of the issues for, uh, for teens is bullying at school, but part of that bullying is on the internet. And there were some really very nice little, because you, you give video clips for the teens, videos on, on the effect that, uh, you know, this bullying on uh, social media has on children, you know. So that, uh, especially if they get a lot of it, you know, then they can take it on board and then they uh, can feel negative about themselves and maybe even suicide. Eventually that's quite a, a prominent cause for suicide in young people. So mm. They say the second cause of death for people between, I think, 17 and 34, uh, is the second cause is suicide. <laughs> so suicide is very, very uh, strong in that age group. So you're looking at the late teens, 20s, early 30s, people uh, often suicide in that, in that age group. And of course, when we have a bit more experience, we have perhaps we'll have less tendency to do it. You know? so, it's a, so I'm very keen on those uh, people who promote you know, uh, a youth suicide prevention. You know? And I've showed a video some time ago that showed a man who was jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge when he was 19 and how he survived and then actually uh, promoted, you know, went, went out to schools and youth groups and uh, taught them about, you know, his experience. He can speak from his own experience so that they can avoid going the same way that he went. He survived. It was very miraculous, actually. Ah, oh, right, right. There we are. I think... We're making you walk, mate. It's okay. I'm trying to look up your health. No, that's, that's it. That's it. Exercise. Uh, Exercise, <laughs> yes. Um, they, they actually have a loaded question. Um, yeah, yes, first, first is, is, it just reminds me, um, the quick chat that we had around um, mm. ancient philosophy and stoicism. Yes. That's um, a good overlap around... Um, mm. There's a philosophy around stoicism that says, don't... Mm. Stoicism. Yeah, on yeah, the ancient yeah. uh, Greek philosophy yeah. that says don't speak the truth or at least don't lie. Mm. 
And the second part is just don't talk about anyone, simply. <laughs> just yeah. don't talk about anyone. Actually, that's very good. Yeah, it's very good. But the, the question, the que uh, actually, it's not really a question. I'm just reminding the, uh, the gentleman, the, the uh, um, young man who tried to commit suicide from uh, the one you just mentioned, Monte, yeah, tried the, to uh, commit suicide from the Golden Bridge in San Golden Francisco. Yeah. He is the only survival from that jump, and um, he now goes to schools, and he says that the only thing he wanted there, if someone had stopped to ask him how he was, yeah. he would have a jump. Mm. He stayed at the bridge for a little while, just waiting someone to ask him, yeah. how are you? And nobody did it. Mm. And that's, I mean, not the reason he jumped, but that's, uh, yeah. he would have avoided that. Mm. So it's a statement more than a question. Yeah, thank you. That's good. Yes, because he says, uh, if somebody had said, are you okay, kid? <laughs> That would have been good for him and could have stopped him because he said even when he was getting off the bus to jump over the rail, he didn't want to do it. He wanted to live. <laughs> and he said when he hit the water and went straight down 70 to 80 feet, he, he said his depression had vanished. <laughs> I'm not surprised because it's the, just the, the drive to survive then because he had uh, shattered the lower vertebras in the spine. So his legs weren't working, so he had to swim with his arms 70 or 80 feet to get to the surface. And then these, he, was, he came to the surface and then he was sinking because these, his shoes, his probably joggers, full of water. And he was going down. And then this thing starts circling around him and you think, oh my God, it's a shark. And he's hitting out. And then he realised it's a sea lion that's actually keeping him afloat. Isn't that amazing? And then the Coast Guard you know, come and rescue him and tell him he's the only person this year at least who survived. So mm -hmm. very good. But your very important thing you mentioned, and the Buddha often used it, was with speech. I didn't say it, and it's very important actually, is that we can remain silent. It's not easy. A Buddha can do it, but it's not easy because people can misinterpret silence and, you know, they can find that very upsetting or insulting um, and take it personally, to say the least. But that is an option, you know, if we don't want to buy into something. We, we can remain silent. You need strength. <laughs> no, there are lots or of comments, comments Ajahn, yes, from online, I'm many good. of them very grateful for the talk. Yep. Um, we have two quick questions, if you have maybe time for two short answers. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, should I explain or defend myself when aggressive people lie and blame me, or lie about me and blame me for things? Wow, should I defend myself when... Aggressive people lie and blame me. Wow, that's really tough. That's very tough. I think one in those situations, one just has to see, you know, if the, it's going to make things worse, actually, and put, put one in the, um, uh, a more difficult situation. You know, oftentimes uh, when we are in those situations, it may be better, this is what I feel, just to walk away. Walk away, because it, it sounds like if the person's very aggressive, you, you defending yourself is just going to buy into the aggressor and the defender or aggressor and victim relationship, you know. So I would just walk away, because no, nothing, they, they're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in hearing your side of the truth anyway. So uh, I think you'd have to gauge. But if somebody's aggressive, you know, then I think that's pretty good grounds for just walking away. Just don't make don't make waves. There's there's no what do they say? There's no communication with fools. There's no when somebody's really aggressive and angry. There's no point. You can't talk sense to them. So it'll probably only end up to your own disadvantage. I would say, but we'll have to see. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. And the last yeah. question from mm. America. Yeah, from America. Um, do you think all con artists and people who continue to thrive telling lies mm. get caught sooner or later? Ah, to all con artists. I think this may be a, a what do you call it? Loaded question, actually. <laughs> Loaded question. I'd, no names mentioned. No, no. Um, do they get caught? Well, they get caught by karma, of course, you know, eventually in one, one form or another, you know, either in this life or in future lives, people are, are fabricating all around them and they don't know what's real and what isn't. And also, you know, then uh, 
one of the big things for con people is how they have real relationships is, is, is an interesting thing. If they're really fabricating uh, stories and lies and for their own advantage around themselves, how do they have a real relationship? That's what I would wonder. So I think they, they do receive the results probably fairly immediately um, because not everybody will believe the con person either. You know, they, don't, they won't believe them. And they will get the results, I would say karmic results, in a future life, in this life, probably this life and in future life, people just won't believe them. They'll have no ability to influence people uh, at all. They won't, even when they're telling the truth, <laughs> people won't believe them. So, But whether it will catch up with the person in this life, I don't know. And you never know because even for the con person, you know they're not always the con person, they're not always the liar, that we're not, we're, because of a Nietzsche change, we're always changing and the circumstances that come up in a person's life can really uh, change their character. So for instance, you know, often when we encounter a lot of suffering and difficulties in our life, we get real. When we get close to death, People are not telling stories, not trying to con. It's a, a real time, actually. People are very direct. That's why it's such a rich time, a rewarding time for people who are caring and the person who's dying too, because it's very meaningful. There's no, there's no uh, space, no time <laughs> for you know, con stories and, and fabricating stuff. This is a real time. So dukkha, you know, difficulties in life, that will, even for a con person, they will be confronted by it. And that can wake them up, you know. They'll stop telling their uh, their fairy tales. <laughs> so, yes. Yes, it is a sickness. It is a sickness, and uh, uh, it's a. I always say too, you know, that we can learn a lot from negative examples. <laughs> so, a con person can be an excellent example of uh, for us not to be like that, not to you know, make up stories for our advantage or somebody else's advantage, you know, just as, you know, remember Ayakema used to say, the best person for teaching us about the danger of drugs or alcohol is an alcoholic. That's fantastic. They'll give you a very good teaching, much more direct than somebody who's in a temperance league. This is, you know, teetotal as we call them. When you see somebody, and especially if they've come out of it, but even if they haven't come out of it, just seeing the suffering in their lives, seeing the suffering in their families' lives, their friends' lives, just enormous. And it's just, wow, what a teaching. So as Ajahn Chah often said, everything is teaching us, but as long as we have the ability to hear and see, as long as we are open and we can see, we can learn from these negative examples too, that we don't want to go that way. You know, so this is very important for us as well. Yes, Helen. I, I just, just a couple of things. Yeah. <coughs> so. um, there's a podcast going around at the moment about a con woman. I think it's called Snowball. Oh. And uh, in the end, it says the person she hurt the most was herself. Oh, really? She woke up. Oh. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> But in terms of all her relationships, so, well, yeah. she, you know, she married. Anyhow, I won't right. tell you the whole story, right. but very damaging. And the second thing is going back to suicide. So. Um, there's actually an Are You OK Day in Australia. Yes, yes. Where we're encouraged to go around to say to people, Are you OK? okay yeah. If you're a bit worried about a friend. Yeah. And it, it really is simple to say and it, it, yeah. it can help. And I, I, I actually found that... I didn't know about this, and I found there was an elastic band, that, and it had, are you okay? I said, what a good message. <laughs> I don't know whether you're supposed to put it on your, your wrist or something like that. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, it's good. So I'd like to finish here now, because we now have the uh, shared lunch, communal lunch next door. You're all welcome. And today, I just heard this morning, I hadn't told uh, uh, Adrian or Chinta, there's another monk coming. So there'll be two monks next door. I think there will. I'll probably get over there and there's only me. <laughs> it's probably changed in the meantime. So you're welcome to come for the uh, communal lunch and this is a very good way to practice the sense of harmony and to promote harmonious speech and getting to know each other. That's good. So please come if you can, can come. Yeah. All right. Uh, 
And now, if you'd like to, we can, those who would like to, can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Thank you. <laughs>